Welcome to Live Doff, your online Doff Yomi Shear. Shalom Aleichem, welcome back to today's Daf Yomi, which is Ksubay's Samach Ches. We are holding on Samach Zayin Amad two lines from the bottom of the Amad. Rabbi Chanina Havo Hahu Anyo. Rabbi Chanina had this poor fellow, Dahavo Raga Lishidur to whom Rabbi Chanina would regularly send Arba Azuzi Kolmali Shabbata four coins. Every Erev Shabbos, it was a weekly donation. It so happens that one, one time, instead of going himself, Rabbi Hanina asked his wife to deliver the coins to this poor person. Suddenly she returns to Rabbi Hanina, and she tells him, Look, this fellow is not in need of your donations. My chazes, why? What, what did you see there? Well, she says, Shami, I overhear as follows. The people there were giving him choices. They asked him as follows. Uh, which tablecloths are you going to be using this Shabbos? Betlei Kesef or Betlei Zav? Silver tablecloths or golden tablecloths? Rashi says it's a reference to the color. White ones or colored ones? Apparently, he's leading a wealthy lifestyle and is not really in need of your uh, donations. Omar Rabbi Hanina responds and he says, Hainu da'amar Rabbi Lazar. This is fully compatible, consistent with Rabbi Lazar's saying. Let's be appreciative of these dishonest and conniving fellows, people who present themselves as poor and are not really so. Shalomalahin, because if not for them, if not for these imposters, we would be sinning on a daily basis when we refuse to give tzedakah to Anim. But now that there are so many out there who are really just pretenders, that allows us for some uh, leeway and it's sort of an excuse uh, for uh, not giving tzedakah. Shanamar, as the Pasuk says, turning away from a, a poor man who's really in need, is a severe Avera. V'kara alech al Hashem v'hoya b'chachet A poor man who's ignored and calls out to Hashem that imposes sin upon the fellow who could have helped him. V'tani rabchia barav midifti And as we learn from rabchia barav, Rabbi Yishu ben Karcha imr. So said the Tan Rabbi Yishu ben Karcha. Kol amalam enav minat staka If a person turns away and ignores the poor man's plight. It is tantamount to idol worship. Why? The Pasuk by the Tzedakah says, Be extra careful. Lest you get involved in something called Blial. Bli oil. Relieving oneself of, 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 of Hashem's yoke, so to speak. Ignoring mitzvahs. The Pasuk employs a very severe term, Blial. Where else do we find this term? By the Zara, we find that term as well. These fellows, Bnei Belial, went out and convinced the others to do Avoy the Zara. And we learn, Malahalon, just as the Loshan Belial in that context is in reference to Avoy Dizkechavma Afkan here as well. When one ignores the plight of a truly needy fellow and does not give tzedakah, it is tantamount to Avoy Dizkechavim. What's the connection? Say the Mepharshim. Look, the whole point of tzedakah is to send a person a message. It's Hashem's money. It's Hashem's world. Share that money with others as per Hashem's instruction. But if a person keeps it all for himself, it's my money, my hard-earned money. I'm not sharing it with anybody. He's sort of turning away from reality, from Hashem's presence, from Hashem's chesed, which is really being in doubt on him. He's ignoring all that. There is a seed of Avodah Zara, of ignoring Hashem's reality, embedded in that behavior. So the fact that there are so many Ramoin, so many imposters roaming around, that uh, gives us some, uh, some leeway in terms of our less than perfect stuck-up performances. Tanar Rabbanon. If one pretends that he's blind, 
But he pretends that his, his stomach is bloated, that he's unwell. Or he pretends that his thighs are not functioning properly. To evoke sympathy, to elicit comp- compassion, to get tzedakah. He will not leave the world until he actually experiences this type of situation. Likewise, I'm a couple of tzedakah. If a person accepts tzedakah, well, he doesn't really need that tzedakah. What will happen to this person? His end will come and he'll be very needy. He won't leave this world until he's actually poor and destitute. It's not awesome. We have a Mishnah in Mesechah's Peah. So if a person owns less than 200 Zuz, he's entitled to go collect a Leket, a Shikha, the Peah, all those um, portions of grain which are meant for the poor people. So that's the minimum you know, threshold in terms of assets. 200 Zuz, less than that, he's considered below uh, you know, the poverty level. He's entitled to the Matanais Aniyam. Let's say he owns a house, he has a car. Are those counted as assets? Are they calculated into the 200 zoos? The answer is no. We don't obligate a poor person to sell his home. That's a basic need. Or his utensils. So the 200 zoos that we're speaking about is on top of a person's basic elementary needs, like home and basic Caleb. Veloy, really? Is that not so? That he has to actually sell them out? Vatanya. You mean to say he doesn't have to sell? Vatanya. Listen to the price. The fellow decided, you know, um, I'm living a grand lifestyle. I have golden vessels, which I use. Golden dishes. Golden silverware. Goldenware. He should go ahead and sell the gold and downgrade to silver. He's accustomed to using silver. He should go down to copper. Apparently, he does have to sell and downgrade. And there we say he doesn't have to sell anything. The answer is it depends what we're speaking about. His bed and table, that he should sell and downgrade. But glasses and dishes, that we don't obligate uh, him to sell. Why, says the Gemara, Why, when it comes to dishes, can he keep his dishes? Because it's personal. He's familiar with them. The Omar will say, I'm uncomfortable using other dishes. So he can keep his high-value dishes. Well, Mito Shulchan Nami, bed and table as well. Omar, he can say, I'm uncomfortable using you know, different types of uh, tables and, and bed. This is my bed, I'm familiar, I'm comfortable with it. Why would we obligate a downgrade? Omar Rava, Bere the Rava, Bemacharesha the Kaspa. Typically, you're right, he doesn't have to sell anything. He keeps his utensils, his table, his chair, his dishes, and silverware. But let's say he has some um, super elegant scraper which he uses in the bathhouse, a Macharesha the Kaspa, a silver Macharesha, a body scraper, that he can downgrade, that he can uh, you know, sell off and use a simple one. So that he has to sell in order to avoid taking Sadaka. Rapapa Amar. He gives another terrors. We had a Mishnah which says you don't have to sell off your assets. We have a Bryce which seems to say that you have to downgrade. Like Kasha, the answer is it depends on where he's holding. At what point? The Mishnah which says no selling is required, they're speaking before anybody's collecting of him. Meaning, a standard case. Uh, where a fellow has 150 zuz, so he's entitled to like a chikha or peya. He doesn't have to sell off his assets or belongings uh, to uh, to avoid collecting the, uh, the you know, the stuck. But the, uh, the price, which indicates that he does have to sell off in order to downgrade, is speaking kan la'achar sheyavoy l'degibboy. Suppose we are already collecting from him. What does that mean? Suppose he took tzedakah unlawfully. And now we're going back to him and recollecting. Taking back that money. At that point, if he can't afford to repay what he took unlawfully, he has to even sell his belongings, downgrade, in order to repay what he took wrongfully. 
Says the Mishnah, Yesoyma, Sheisi Asa, Ima Oyachel. So we know that a father can marry off his daughter. That marriage catches. It holds Minatur. But if there's no father, nobody will marry her off Minatur if she's Ektana. But there's a Takam that mother or brothers can marry her off. So that's what happened. They married her off Midata with full consent. In terms of dowry, they were a bit uh, on the low side, a bit stingy with her. Because for law, how much did they commit for her? Bemeya or Bechamisham Zuz, 150 Zuz, a small size dowry. That's unfair. So when she grows up and becomes wiser and smarter, she can turn around and ask them for the rest. She can take from them what, uh, what was coming to her. That's a sheet of the Tanakhama. Now, how much is that? So Rashi says, Isur Nechasim, 10% of the uh, father's estate. And Taisvah Sanam Abbey says, Why uh, 10%? Mishum de Stam Bnei Adam, Kach Noisnim Libnei Seya. Typically, a father gives about 10% of his assets. And if the father would have been here, he would have given her that amount. So the Chacham established Isur Nechasim, the 10% amount as a standard amount for one's dowry to be taken from his estates. That's the Tanakhama. Rabbi Yudha Aymar, he disagrees. It's all a matter of evaluating and assessing her departed father's mindset. You can't set a standard fee. It's all about the person and his mindset. How generous, how stingy. Im Suppose father had already married off his older daughter with a large, generous dowry. So after the father passed away, now it's time for the second daughter to marry. We give her the same amount. Rashi says whether it's more than 10% or less than 10%, it's all a matter of the father's mindset. They disagree. You can't compare first daughter to the second daughter. Look, it can happen that a person was an ani, a poor man, suddenly he gained wealth. Or conversely, usher, he started as an usher, and suddenly he becomes an ani. What he afforded yesterday, he can't afford today. So how could you compare the kids to each other? Rather, the proper route to take is, take a look at the assets, evaluate, take 10%, and give it to the to the daughter for her marriage. Amar Shmuel. So Shmuel will follow Rabbi Yehuda's approach. It's about mindset. It's about evaluating the father's attitude. Le Parnasa, when it comes to the dowry arrangement for the for the Yisema, Shem and Ba'ab, we estimate based on our evaluation of her father's mindset. Generous or stingy. Meisvi, here comes a kash. Is it personal? No. Habonis nezoinis umas parnasais. So daughters get their, their food, their mezoinus, their panasa, their needs from their departed father's assets. Case that has this work out. We don't say as follows. Should the father have been here, if your father would be alive, he would give her such and such. We don't work like that. Rather, we take a close look at the assets that he left behind and we assess the assets. We give it to her. Says the Gemara, my love, Parnassus Habal. Shall we not assume that we're speaking about the dowry arrangements? Apparently, it's asset related, not mindset related. We're not speaking about dowry at all, we're speaking about her personal needs. And that has nothing to do with the father's mindset. Why? So Tesis answers. He says, when it comes to her personal needs, her food, her clothing, that is something which was enshrined into, into the ksuba. It's a chiv, it's a tznai ksuba. Not up to the father, it's not personal. So those provisions are standardized. They're standard provisions. We had a whole mission about it. How much you give to this one, to that one. Chitim, sir. We know exactly how much a person needs per week. 
Hashem. The more the assets there are, the more we give her. As per the Mishnah back on the Psamach Dalat. As opposed to Parnosa of marriage, meaning dowry offerings, that is not something that a person must do. He doesn't have to provide that for his kids. Rather, that's totally in his das, in his mindset. And that, according to Shmuel, is based on our evaluation in terms of her father's mindset. What he would have given her if he would be here. Was he a generous man? Was he a stingy man? So that's how Tosis explains the difference between the two things. So that's the Tarsus of the Gemara. Parnassus Atzma. We're speaking about personal needs, not dowry related. Asks the Gemara, what do you mean? Hanes Zoynes, Umis Parnassus Ketani. Take a look at the price. We have two terms. Nezoynes, which sounds like personal needs, current needs. And then we have Parnassus, which indicates dowry. My love should we not assume as follows. Achas parnosa sabal, vachas parnosa atzma. Nezoinis refers to her, her personal uh, current needs. And a misparnosa is that's the dowry arrangement. And both are asset related, not mindset related, as per Shmuel's opinion. Loy, no, idibi idibi parnosa atzma. Both terms, mezoinis and parnosa, in this price, is a reference to her current needs. Well, Akasha, why the redundancy? Well, there are two types of needs. One refers to food and drink, mezoinus. The Lashain of Misparnasais refers to clothing and covering. Not dowry related, but dowry? That works based on mindset. Tanan, let's take a look at our Mishnah and see if it works. So Rabbi Yehuda says the uh, second daughter is entitled to the same amount of dowry as her older sister. Tanan v'chachamim chachamim disagree. Pa'amim she'adam ani v'hesher. Ahi asher v'heni. How can you compare? A person's fortunes can change. It can go down, it can go up. Elo shaman ha'nechasim v'naisin lo. Rather, the correct approach is take a look at what's left behind. Evaluate the assets and give her according. Now, my Ani or my Ashi. What did they mean when they spoke about an Ani and Ashi? Literally? I name Ani. Ani bin Achasim. Ani means he's literally poor. Asher means Ashi bin Achasim wealthy. So now, Chachamim were disagreeing. With whom? With the Tanakama, with Rabbi Yehuda, Who maintains that she can get exactly like her older sister. What do you mean? His fortunes changed. He went up, he went down. How can you compare? So you mean to say that the previous Tana will hold even if he married his first married off his first daughter when he was wealthy and then suddenly he went down. The second daughter is entitled to the same amount as her older sister? Leslie, he doesn't have the same amount. The assets are totally de- depleted. How could he compare the two two sisters? El Olav. Oh, so apparently we have to reinterpret these uh, terms of Ani and Asher. We're not speaking literally poor or wealthy. We're speaking about his mindset. Does he have a poor man's mindset or a rich man's mindset? When we have the word Ani, it means Ani Badas, a poor man's mindset. He's not willing to give much. He's stingy. And when we say usher, it means usher bedas, a wealthy man's mindset, generous, giving. So the Chacham are telling Rabbi look, you never know, perhaps, you know, his mindset changes between one kid and the other. Where he gave this one, he's not willing to give that. You can't compare the two things. And bottom line is that we ignore the father. Rather, Uktani, the Mishnah says, how do we proceed? How do we establish the dowry amount? By way of assessing the assets themselves. We take a look at the assets, and based on that we give her. It's pretty clear we don't follow the umdana factor. Umdana meaning evaluating her father's mindset. We ignore it, it's a non-factor. There's going to be a kasha on Shmuel, who says, father's mindset is what determines the amount. Answers the Gemara, sure. 
This is the Chachamim speaking. Shmuel was going like Rabbi Yehuda, who followed the father's mindset. Who the Amak Rabbi Yehuda? Shmuel was following Rabbi Yehuda. That's not Rabbi the Aimer. It's all about the father's attitude. Im Heisi Basari Shaina. If father had already married off his first daughter and given her a generous dowry, you know, send the Shnia Kedarach Shanas and the So now, when it's time for the second uh, daughter to marry, and her father is no longer here, she deserves the same amount. Why? Because it's all a matter of mindset and attitude. And if this was the, uh, the father's attitude then, we maintain that same uh, standard all throughout the older sisters. So that's Shmuel's uh, shita. Parnasa is based on father's mindset. Says the Gemara, if that's the case, the neighbor, then Shmuel should simply say, instead of you know, presenting sort of his own halacha, the parnasa, shaman ba'av, he should just say, look, we have a machlekes. I pass like Rabbi Yudah. After all, that's what he's saying. Right? He's going with shita's Rabbi Yudah. The name halach Rabbi Yudah. Why couldn't he just say, you should know the halacha follows Rabbi Yudah. The answer is, i amar halacha Rabbi Yudah. Had he only have said that, have I mean that perhaps I would mistakenly think, davka hasiyah. You see, Rabbi Yudah speaking about a case where father had already married off that first daughter. So I would say perhaps only in that case where he literally married her off. And that sort of set down a precedent in terms of how much he's willing to offer. The goli daite, we already showed in a tangible way how much he's willing to give. So then we maintain, maintain that standard. Avalohi is but suppose he never married off any kids yet. Loi, maybe we can't just uh, work with that mindset and evaluate what he would have theoretically given her. Kamash the chiddush of Shmuel is yes. Even if we don't have a real tangible, solid precedent in terms of what he would have given, we can do an umdana, we can do a shuma, we can evaluate and estimate uh, based on how we know him and based on uh, his personality, whether he's a generous fellow or otherwise. Kamash Mala. Taim ad so Shmuel is telling us that Rabbi Yehuda's base is because the Azlina Basu Umdana. It's based on the concept of Umdana, Loishna Yisiyah, Loishna Lo Yisiyah, irrespective of whether father actually married off his daughter and gave her a dowry, Loishna Lo Yisiyah, or he never got to that point, never actually married her off. We take the Umdana factor and we ride with it. Now, Vahidik Tani Yisiyah. So why didn't the Mishnah specifically Refer to a case where father married off that daughter. If that factor isn't really necessary for Rabbi Yehuda's halacha, answer is to highlight the sheet of the rabbanan, the afag of the yisya. Even in this case, where he actually married off his daughter and gave her X Y Z in terms of dowry, and he showed what he has in mind. That's not enough to set a precedent. We ignore that. We just focus on the assets themselves. And as Rashi tells us in the Mishnah, we give her 10%. Can we use your name? And teach in your name that the Allah follows Rabbi Yehuda? That the umdana factor is what carries the day? It's all about mindset and attitude of the father rather than the actual asset value? Amalei so. Rav Chizda responds 100%. Yehei Rava. It should be the Rasan of Hashem. Kol ki hani. Mili Malyasa, any of these good things, Tidushumi Shmoy, you should expound on my name. Sure, related to me, I'm all for it. So, bottom line is, the Rava and Rav Chizda hold that we follow the Umdana factor in determining the dowry level. Asks the Gemara, Umiya Amar Rava Hachi, is that so that according to Rava, it's all about mindset? Vatanya Rabbi Oyman. Rebbe holds, Bas a daughter who's getting her sustenance from her brothers after her father's passing. No, tell us Isra Nechasim. When marriage arrives, she takes 10% of the assets for her dowry. And Rebbe tells us, That's the Allah. It's a set amount. It's not a fluctuating amount based on mindset. It's a set standard amount of 10%. Like Kasha, the answer is like this. It all depends on the circumstance. 
When we are familiar with his father's way of life and his attitude, sure, then that determines the level of dowry. But if we're not familiar with him, we don't know what, uh, what he would have done. Rashi says he wasn't part of the community. We're not sure where he would have gone in terms of dowry. In that case, there's nothing to estimate, there's nothing to evaluate. We can't assess his mindset. And we set it at 10%. In fact, we're going to prove our point that when we are able to evaluate his mindset, we, we use that as the yardstick. The Omar of Adabarav. Masa, there was a story. Rebbe himself, who a minute ago tells us it's 10%, this time he gave her 1 in 12. It's about 8% of the Nechassim. Well, that's a straight out contradiction. The two halachas contradict each other. Is it 1 in 10 or 1 in 12? Oh, apparently, that proves our point. If it was Lea Midnight, we have no clue what he would have done. Then it's a standard 10%. But if it's Abmidnay, we know exactly what he would have done. Then we follow accordingly. Gufa, let's go back to Omar Rebbe. Basan is Enismana Ach. A daughter is getting Parnasa. And they tell us Isra Nachasim, she gets 10% for her dowry. Omar Lay the Rebbe. Chacham asked Rebbe, how do you work out this arrangement? Ludvarech, according to you, it's 10% per kid. Then let's say he has 10 daughters and a son. He left behind ten daughters and a son. So each one of the daughters gets 10%. There's nothing left for the poor son. Do you mean to say he'll, he'll be left with nothing? Amr Lehan has a very response. No, no, no. You got to work it out like this. I meant as follows. It's staggered. It's 10% of what was left behind by the previous daughter. The first daughter to marry gets 10%. So we're left with 90. The second daughter gets 10% of 90, which is only 9. The third one gets only 10% of what was left behind. So then there's left, there's some left at the end of the day for the boy. But after they all get their standard, stagger 10%, They'll put it back into one pot and split it and divide it equally. Asks the Gemara, why? What do you mean? Each girl took what, what was deserving to her. Why would you go and re divvy it? No, he meant like this. Typically, you're right. I take my 10%, you take your 10%, and we go our merry way. But, suppose they're all coming to marry simultaneously. So now it's unfair for one to take more than the other. So what do we do? On the one hand, we want them all to have an equal amount. On the other hand, we want to leave some over for the boy. Oh. So we apply the following interesting arrangement. So in this case, the first girl takes, you know, let's say it's 100, it takes 10. The second one takes 9, the third one takes, you know, 8 point something, etc., etc., and then at the end of the day, we have some left over for the boy. He takes the rest. Then they take all what they had, you know, taken the ten and the nine, and they redivide it equally. Why? You see, in terms of the boy, how do we reckon what what uh, what he's supposed to get? We have to employ the ten percent system, right? That's just a standard system employed in terms of deducting for the dowry. So we employ the 10% system, the staggered 10% system. Now we know how much the boy is supposed to get. He takes his portion. But the fact is that the girls are not deserving of these amounts. Because as we said, we're all coming to marry at once. Why should I get more than you and me less than you? Right? So in order for it to be fair and square, we take all those amounts we put it back in the pot and we divvy it equally amongst all the girls. Interesting arrangement. So like two sides, two, two parts to this arrangement. First part is to figure out how much goes to the boy. So we start with 100, 10 daughters. First daughter gets theoretically the first 10. 
Then we take 10% off the rest for the second kid, 10% off the rest for the third kid, etc., etc. When we finish that configuration, whatever is left over goes to their brother. We're done with him. Now, it's unfair for the first girl to get 10, and the second 9, and the third 8, because they're all coming to marry at the same time. Why should one get more than the other? So the fair way to do it is take everything and redivide it equally. Misayeli the Rav Masna, this is the writer of Masna, Rav Masna, imbo kulon linose kulon ka'achas. If they're all coming to marry at once, noitolo is isur echad. So they take one ten percent. What do you mean? Isur echad sagadayit? One ten percent? What does that mean? El noitolo is isur ke'achad. We do the ten percent system, but it's ke'achad, it's a simultaneous arrangement, meaning instead of Rachel taking ten and walking away and Leah getting all ten percent, of what was left over, we make a uh, single arrangement for all, we divide it equally amongst them all. Tana Rabbah. Until what point, until what age can a girl claim dowry from her father's assets? So we know when it comes to Mazoinais, for instance, there is an, uh, there's, a, there's a ceiling, there's a limit. Either she marries, or she's a Baigeris, right? She turns from Katana into a Nara at 12, and half a year later turns into Baigeris, a full-fledged adult. That's when her Mazoinus uh, collection um, privilege expires. Right? So that's when it comes to Mazoinus. What about when it comes to Parnos? This dowry arrangement. Right? As Taisa has already explained to us, it's a totally different arrangement than Mazoinus. Mazoinus is part of the Ksuba. And in the Ksuba it says, as long as you're in my home, and you're, you're part of the family, you're entitled to mazoinus, to provisions. And so you become a gedoyla until you marry and leave that. But when it comes to parnosa, perhaps it's a different type of system. Is it or is it not? Machleki is tanoi. Tanoi rabbanon. Habonai is bein bagru achaloi nisu. Whether she's already a begeris, without marriage. Or bein nisu achaloi bagru. Or they married even before becoming a begeris. If the Mazenus same, there's no longer Mazenus for them. That's the, uh, that's the Tanai Ksuba. It says it clearly in the Ksuba until you become a Begeris. Then you're sort of on your own. Or you marry. But when it comes to Parnasa, she can still get that. If the Parnasa, the uh, Parnasa, the dowry arrangement, she still can, uh, she's still entitled to. Nothing to do with the fact that she's. Uh, it doesn't matter, even if she's a Begeris, or even if she had already married. Let's say she was a, a Nara, and she got married, and uh, they gave her something, but she didn't get really what she deserved. She can come back and collect the rest. Divrei Rebbe. So going to Rebbe, unlike Mazoinus, which expires once you turn adult, or expires once you marry, Parnasa doesn't work like that. You're still entitled. You're still entitled. Rabbi Shimon ben Lazar, Oymar Af Ibdu Parnasasan. According to Rabbi Shimon ben Lazar, Parnas and Mazenus on the same boat. Once you become a Begeris, you're out of here. You're on your own. Parnas is only for somebody who's still within the family, within the fold. But once you're a Gdoila, you're on your own. You lose that, that privilege. And the same thing with a Nara, even before Begeris. But a, a Nara that married. And she took whatever they gave her and left. You didn't ask for more? That's it. You gave it up. So Kate said, hey, no, he said, so according to this shita, what's a girl going to do to ensure that she has a dowry? Because she knows once she turns 12 and a half, a big she's going to lose it. Seichers land bound, they hire a husband to marry them. And we'd seen land parnasasan, he'll extract the parnasa, the dowry. This is the only way to really ensure a dowry. They do it before they become a big Okay, so we have... Rav Shimon Lazar seems to hold that Parnasa and Mazoinus go hand in hand. Parnasa has a similar deadline to uh, Mazoinus. Once you turn adult or once you marry, you lose everything. Whereas according to Rebbe, it's unrelated. Mazoinus, that's connected to your presence in the home, part of the family. But Parnasa, no expiration, expiration date on that. Omar of Nachman, so Rav Nachman tells us, Amar li Huna. Huna told me. Rav Huna told me. Hilchas Rebbe. We follow Rebbe. That's the halacha When it comes to parnasa, meaning the 
the dunya, the dowry, uh, you know, payment that she can take even later on. Ace Rav Rabbi has a kasha to Rav Nachman. You tell me there's no uh, expiry date on that. Back to the mission. So you have a Yusayma, who, who's a Tana right now, right? Pre 12 years old. Her mother, her brother married her off. And they skimped on her dowry. They didn't give her what she deserved. Because for love of Zuz, they gave her just a bit, 150 Zuz. So when she gets a bit older and smarter, she can turn around and claim the rest. When she becomes a Gdaila, she can go and be mighty lahitzi miyadam asheroi lenasen la and take the rest. Oh, Tama the Ketana. Let's have a diuk in the Mishnah. This only works because she was married as a Ketana. So she still maintains her rights and privileges as per her dowry claims. But apparently, if she would have married as a Gdaila, she was already a Nara, 12 years old, and then married at that point. What would happen? Vitra. Then she would be giving it up. She can no longer turn around and claim the rest. Now the mission speaks talking about her a katana. But suppose she was already a, a gdoyla and then got married. She's aware. She's an adult. Even if she's only an ar. But once she's passed past mitzvah, she marries, she detaches, she disengages. Okay, you gave me what you gave me. Have a nice day. And she can, can, she can no longer come back and claim the rest. And here, we have Shita's Rebbe, and we Paskin like that, that even uh, if she got married, she can still come back and get the rest of the uh, Nedunya. The answer is like this, like Kasha, Hodem Achoy, Rebbe speaking, where she protested, she let it be known, look, I'm not giving it up, I'm going to come back later. <laughs> the Mishnah, which sounds like she gave it up, is speaking, she didn't utter a word, she didn't complain, she didn't object, in which case, she gave it up. I'll prove that this indeed is true. That Rabbi Salacha applies only when she did a mecha and put them on notice. They came because otherwise, Kasha the Rebbe at the Rebbe, we're going to have a Kasha within Rebbe itself. Why? Because here, Rebbe seems to say, that she'll get the uh, Parnasa later on, right? Then we have another Rebbe, which we had in Amar Aleph, the Sanya, Rebbe Oimer, Basan, Azoynes, Menachem, Noitelas, Isra, Nechas, a daughter, who is currently being fed by her brothers, she's getting Mezoynes, which basically means, she's not a, uh, she's not a Gedoyla, right? She's a Ketana or a Nara, we know Mazoinus only goes until she becomes a beggar. That's a given, right? So when he says a daughter who's getting Mazoinus indicates that she's still like Tana Ori, Nara, not yet a beggar. She will get Isr Nechas and she can collect her dowry from her father's assets. Let's make a diuk. Mazoinus in only because she's still at a point in life where she's being fed. She's still young. She's still part of the family. She ain't a Nezaynas loy, but otherwise, if she's past that point, she's already by Geras, who lost her, her Nezaynas. She's detached, disengaged, on her own. That's it. She loses all rights and all privileges. And here Rebbe tells us that even a by Geras can get Parnasa, can get the dowry. El Olav Shema, we know it's a clear raya to our distinction. It depends whether she put them on notice or not. Hadem Echoy, if she was Meicha, and she still gets it. Hadem Echoy, but if she was not Meicha, she accepted her fate, and she gave up all rights. Shema Mino. Amalei Ravina the Rav. Here comes another kash. Ravina tells Rav, Amalei Rav Adabar Ava Mishimcha. Rav Adabar Ava quoted you, told us in your name. Bogra Eina Tzricha Limchais. So this girl becomes a Begeris, even without being Meicha. She will still get, you know, the 10% for a dowry. Likewise, Nis says, Even if she already married, let's say she's a Nara, not a beginner, she's a Nara, and she got married. Without saying boo, she'll still get the Parnasa, she still gets the 10%. Bagra Venis is Trichalimchais. Suppose she's already a full fledged adult, a beginner is plus, she's already married, so there's two reasons, two. Uh, 
two cards, so to speak, stacked against her. She's totally disengaged from the family. She's a Begaris plus married. She can no longer collect the Nadunya, the dowry, unless she's Moicha and she put us on notice beforehand. So this is who's speaking. This is Rav. Okay, so Rav is telling us the only time a Mecha is needed to maintain her Nadunya privilege is if A, she's a Begaris and married, but otherwise she doesn't have to protest, she doesn't have to inform us that she's still collecting the Parnasa. She's supposed to, she, she has a full right to collect it even without a Mecha. Really? That's a total contradiction to what we just said. Mi Amar Rav Hachi. Did Rav really tell us that? Vo Eisvei Rav Rav Nachman. We had the whole back and forth between Rav Rav Nachman and Esther Kasha from the Mishnah, which says Yisayma. Uh, we had a diok there that if uh, you know uh, she becomes a gdoila, she loses the parnas of Ishanali, and Rav answered him, and, and Rav Nachman answered him. Well, it all depends on the circumstance whether she was meicha or not. Mecha is a required element for her to maintain her parnasa rights. Hada Machi, she protested. She put him on notice. She informed that she's still going to come back and collect her dowry, then she's deserving of it. But if she didn't do a machah, she loses it. And here you tell me, machah is not a necessary ingredient. Even with that machah, she's still entitled to the uh, nedunya. Like Kasha, the answer is like this. I have to put in another factor. You see, if She's getting parnas. She's getting mezainas. She's being fed by her brothers. So perhaps she doesn't want to you know, get on their bad side. She doesn't want to rock the boat. Or perhaps she feels appreciation to them for their efforts on her behalf. So if she's getting mezainas from them, she's embarrassed to be moicha. She's embarrassed to put them on notice. Look, by the way, I still have an account with you. I'm going to get that million dollars when I marry. She doesn't want to talk about it. She makes no reference to the parnas. So the fact that she didn't mention it in no way is an indication that she's giving it up, that she's forfeiting it. So she still gets it. So even if she's a Begeris, and didn't say a word, or she's a, a Nara, who got married and didn't say a word, she can turn around and collect the Nadunya, the dowry. Whereas the, the Mishnah, which indicated that once she becomes a Gdala, she loses you know, the Parnas, unless she was Meicha, unless she protested and let them know, that's speaking when she's not getting Mezaynas. So there's absolutely no reason why she didn't make mention of it. She should have spoken about it. The fact that you didn't speak about it, you forfeit it. So bottom line is, as the, the Riff explains the Gemara, if we have two factors against her, she's already too old, a Begeris, plus she's married, in that case she has to be Meicha regardless. Without macha, you lose the nedunya. But if she's only a begeris, or only married, a nara who's married, we're dealing with only one element of, of distancing, only one detachment, so to speak, whether it's age or marriage. In that case, it depends. If she's getting mezunya, she has a right to keep quiet and still maintain her parnasa, her nedunya rights. But if there's no Mazayin is forthcoming from the brothers, she should have said, she should have spoken up. The fact that you didn't, that's a forfeiture of your Parnassa rights. This is all Shitas Rebbe, whereas according to Rabbi Shimon Lazar, Parnassa and, and Mazayin go hand in hand. Just as there's a, a ceiling in terms of Mazayin, once you become a big heiress or you marry, that's it, no more Mazayin. Same thing with Parnassa. Parnassa meaning Nadunya, dowry, uh, you know, uh, payments. But according to Rebbe, it's all relative to the situation. Amar of Hunam Rebbe. So we spoke about two distinct obligations. One is Mazoinis, where she's fed from her father's assets. One is what we call Parnassa. She's entitled to, uh, to um, access her father's assets to obtain a dowry for her marriage. So one is enshrined in the Ksuba, it's not up to him. Mazaynas is a Tznai Bezin, Parnasa is all personal. It's a volunteer type of offering. Omar of Hunam Rebbe, Parnasa, Eina Gitnai Ksuba. Parnasa, dowry arrangements for the daughter, is not uh, considered 
exuba stipulation. What does this mean? My ain't not a exuba. What does it mean? It's not like a tnai exuba, not a mezoinus. In which way is it different than mezoinus? Shall we say as follows? Dilu parnasa tar from mishabdi. Suppose after her father's passing, her brothers you know, sold off some of the assets, made it mishubat, they tied it up. So when it comes to Mizoinus, she can't collect from that. The, the, the Rashi brings a Gemara because it's an open-ended commitment. The, uh, you know, the buyers have no idea to, to be careful from it. It's not a set amount. And, and, you know, so there's no din that she can go access those properties which were t- tied up or sold by her brothers. But perhaps Parnas is different because it's a, it's a set amount. You know, it's 10% of the assets. People can be careful from that. You know, when they purchase properties, they can account they can see whether there's enough, you know, enough free assets to uh, cover the, you know, the parnas, the ten percent um, dowry type of uh, payment. So that's different, and in that case, she can go collect it from the buyers of her father's properties. Is that what you mean to say? Parnas is different than mezainis in this regard. In or shall we say dilu parnas tie from mishab? When it comes to the dowry arrangement, that she can go ahead and collect from tied up properties. With Tanaik Suba, as opposed to Mazoinus, Loy Tai from Mishabi, that cannot be collected from those properties. Mike Mashman, what's the point of, uh, of Rav Huna saying this in the name of Rebbe, which sounds like this is novel, a Chiddush, Hamas and Mechalyayim, this is a daily affair in Bezdin, we make that distinction, it's well known. Moitzin le Parnasa, when it comes to Parnasa, we take from these properties. Vein Moitzin le Mazoinus, as opposed to Mazoinus, we don't extract tied up properties. So there's no Chiddush here, it's a known halach. Ve'ela, perhaps, he's trying to say something else. He's trying to draw a line between Parnassa and Mazenis in a different regard. When it comes to the Parnassa, the dowry, she can take it even from, you know, from uh, belongings, from ass, from uh, mobile, uh, you know, uh, object, not necessarily real estate. As opposed to Mazenis. For that, you can only access Karka, is that true? Because uh, Mizoinus works differently. It's uh, it's a standard Shibud of Ksuba. We know that typically claims and, and, and Shibudim only pertain to Karka. Is that what you mean to say? But Parnasa, that's a different type of thing. And that you can collect from anything? It's incorrect. says the one Rebbe, because according to Rebbe Shita, whether it's this or that, whether it's Mizoinus or Parnasa, you can access uh, even metal in the sanya, echad nechasim sheish lachrais. Whether we're speaking about real estate, which are safe and secure, ve'echad nechasim she'ein lachrais, or mobile items which are not really safe and secure, both of these things can be accessed. Moitzin lamazoin, huishal ulabonis. Even Rebbe, according to Rebbe, even when it comes to collecting from mazoinis, you can access all these types of assets. So there's no difference between mazoinis and parnas in this regard. So what then is the distinction between the two? Elamai. So apparently it means like this. This touches on the uh, the core, fundamental difference between Mezoinus, which is enshrined, a formalized in Eksuba as a Tanai Bezden, which doesn't leave the father much of a choice. Whether or not he's going to give it, it's established by Bezden, as opposed to Parnasa, which is personal. Elamai Parnasa, Enukit Nai Ksuba, when we need to say that Parnasa is not like Nai Ksuba, look at the Sanya, as per the following price. It's your choice. Ha'imer, a fellow declares as follows. He's passing away. He says, look, I don't want my daughters to access my assets for their mezoinus. Ain shemila, we ignore that directive because it's a tenai bezn, which applies equally to all. But when he speaks about dowry expenses, that's up to him. Let's say he says, look, I'm unwilling to provide my dowry if my daughters don't access my property for that. In that case, we have to accept it. Shaparnasa eno ketnaik suba because parnas is not etnaik suba. It's assumed that any decent father would provide for his daughter, but if a person adamantly refuses to provide, we have no choice but to accept it. So that's the difference between the two uh, payments. Okay, so let's just quickly recap the beginning of the sugya, and then we'll go down to the most recent sugya and try to wrap it up with a chart. So we started with the Tztaka Sugya. This fellow turned out to be an imposter. Rebchenina was pretty satisfied. He says, look, he absolves all, the, uh, all, the, all, the, all of us. He absolves us from Chet because now we have what to blame it on. A person who pretends uh, to be desperately in need of public assistance and doesn't really need so. Read, doesn't really need it. Uh, his punishment is that he leaves the world 
suffering from that very condition. Okay, then we discussed uh, the uh, dowry circuit. So basically, we have two types of chiyuvim. We have mezoinus, which is really part of the tanai suba, and it's a chayv on a person. Then we have parnasa. Right? So upon his passing, his daughter will access some of his properties to provide herself with dowry needs. That is not a tanai suba, and that's midaita, that's personal. How many differences do we have between mezoinus and parnasa? Well, Mazinus uh, has a sheer, an, an established amount. We have the Mishnah, which gives us the, you know, the weekly allocation. And of course, that's the minimum. And the sky's the limit. It's all in proportion to uh, the, the amount of assets left behind. As opposed to Parnasa, that is determined by the Das of the father. What was the father's mindset? So, according to Chachamim, it's not very personal. Rather, it was a set established rate which was enshrined by the Chachamim, Isr, Isr, Nechassim, 10%, and as Jesus explains, that's Stam B'nei Adam, we assume, typically a person gives 10% per kid, per dowry. Whereas Rabbi Yudah Shita, and that's how Shmuel Paskins, it's all about um, it's all about Umdana, evaluating, assessing a father's mindset. Was he generous? Was he stingy? So there is no set amount on that. It's all personal, per situation. What else do we have between Mezoinus and Parnas? Is there an expiry date? So when it comes to Mezonius, it certainly is. Mezonius only goes to a Yisayim Ozaktana or Yinara, who have not yet married. The one she's a Begeris, or a Nara who married, that's it. She's out of the family. There's no more Mezonius in that case. But when it comes to Parnasa, so according to Shita's Rebbe, it works based on totally different guidelines. Even a, a Nara who's married, or even a, a Begeris who's not yet married, Provided they were meicha, okay, they, they uh, sort of put us on notice. We're speaking that they're getting mezainas, so they, um, sorry, they're not getting mezainas. So in that case, we require a, a mecha, right, and she should be okay being meicha, no reason why she should hesitate. So in that case, if she was meicha, uh, then, then she um, is still entitled to the parnasa. And the same thing with a, a boigeres, who is married, so uh, there were two reasons why, why she shouldn't get the Parnassa. She sort of detached herself on two on two fronts, one in terms of age, one in terms of marital status. She's a Bagaris who is a Nesua. In that case, she has to be Moicha regardless of whether or not she's getting Mazainas. That's how the riff, the riff explains the Gemara. So at this point, only through Mecha will she, will she still be entitled, will she still, will, will she still maintain her Parnassa rights. One more difference, that was at the end of the sugya. When it comes to Mazoinus, that's only from B'nei Chayrim, because it's an undefined, open-ended amount. We can't uh, burden the, the purchasers with that type of uh, a claim, as opposed to Parnassah, which is a set standard amount, at least according to Shittas Chachamim, which is uh, ten, it's a 10% amount. In that case, we, um, we, we expect the you know, potential purchasers of, of their property to look out for this type of, uh, you know, uh, a lien and claim against them and uh, steer clear of it. So in this case, if they go, go ahead and, and purchase properties, she can turn around and collect from them to provide for her panasa for her dowry marriage needs. All the best to you and Hatzlacha Rabba always.